Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Cantor. As president of the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada, I would like to welcome all of you to this evening's program, The Return of the Jew, the revival of Yiddish culture in post-Holocaust Israel. Before we commence with the program, I would like to say a few words about our organization. The Jewish Heritage Center plays a pivotal role in preserving and promoting our very rich Jewish heritage. The Jewish Heritage Center also serves as an advocate for anti-racism and education on the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. The Jewish Heritage Center helps foster an understanding and awareness of how the past shapes our contemporary reality and our collective and individual identities. The archive at the Jewish Heritage Center constitutes a key element in the day-to-day -day activities of the Jewish Heritage Center. The Jewish Heritage Center's archive is the principal repository of the history of the local Jewish community, as well as Jewish settlements in Northwest Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. It is a major destination for academics and the general public, and its resources have been used for countless publications, lectures, school projects, conferences, and workshops. The Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada is located on ancestral lands, on Treaty 1 territory. The Red River Valley is also the birthplace of the Métis. We recognize the historical fact emphasized by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and as acknowledged by the Government of Canada, that the Canadian government and various religious and secular organizations that predate the country perpetuated a genocide against the Indigenous peoples and that elements of that genocide continue to the present day. We affirm that our commitment to never forget must also include confronting attempts to destroy indigenous culture and nationhood and condemning attempts to deny that historical reality. Finally, I want to acknowledge the humanitarian crisis that is being inflicted on and unfolding in the Ukraine and that we stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian community during this tragic time. Dan? Thank you, Mark. I'm Dan Stone. I'm the chair of the Programs and Exhibits Committee of the Jewish Heritage Center. Uh, we organize a range of programs. In recent months, we've gone from subjects like the Jewish chess players of Winnipeg to a launch of Wayne Hoffman's family memoir of life and death in Winnipeg in 1913. Tonight, we're going in a somewhat uh, broader geographical uh, direction, but we're going to explore topics which are very dear to the Winnipeg Jewish community, that is Yiddish and Israel. I'm going to turn the program over now to Professor Ben Bader, who will, can, who will uh, direct as things go on. Uh, ben was born in West Germany, did his undergraduate education in Berlin, did graduate studies in Jewish history at Columbia University in New York. And we had the good fortune that he came here to be professor of history at the University of Manitoba. He, his teaching and research specialize in Jewish history, German history, and gender history. And he's very active in the Judaic studies program. In conjunction with that, he is active in the community com committee in support of Judaic studies. He is also a member of the board of directors of the Jewish Heritage Center. Following the main talk, there will be time for questions and comments. Please use the chat line to pose your questions. Following the question and answer period, Beljanievsky, executive director of the Jewish Heritage Center, will conclude the program with a few words about upcoming events. Thank you very much and Please go ahead, Ben. Very good evening. Thanks, Dan, for the friendly introduction. And um, let me now return the favor and introduce um, our speaker, Dr. Itai Zutra. Dr. Zutra was born and raised in Israel and came to us in Winnipeg um, 10 years ago. 
in 2012 as the IELTS Parents Teaching Fellow. At the time, we did not have a university trained Yiddish instructor in the city. And as the coordinator of the Judaic Studies program at the time, I cooperated with the Gray Academy and the IL Parents Shul Endowment Trust to create a two year position, the IL Parents Teaching Fellowship. And here I like to express great, deep gratitude for the tremendous um, efforts in this, in this um, project and a generosity and fundraising efforts by the IL Parents Shul Endowment Trust at the time. And most of all, we were extremely lucky to win Dr. Zutra for our position. So Dr. Zutra at the time had just earned his doctorate in modern Yiddish literature from the um, Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And I called him the Prince of Yiddish when he came here. I had less gray yeah. hair. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, um, yeah. and we're even luckier, of course, that he stayed in Winnipeg and has continued to teach Yiddish and Hebrew language and modern Jewish, modern Jewish culture courses at the University of Manitoba. He's also active at the Winnipeg Jewish community at large. He writes a Yiddish column for the Winnipeg Jewish Post. He leads the Yiddish reading, reading group at the, at the Gwen Sector Center, has been um, lecturing widely about Jewish culture for a range of local um, groups. Um, Yet let me also say that funding for Dr. Zutra's successful and often well-enrolled university care courses has been precarious beyond his two-year initial engagement. So he would not be here anymore with the efforts, without the efforts of the um, Committee in Support for Judaic Studies that was previously called the Committee for the Preservation of Yiddish Language and Culture in many large and small donors over the years. Um, that have really enabled um, Dr. Zutra's engagement year by year. The Asper Foundation too has consistently been supporting our classes and the community co committee has been able to successfully establish endowments to enable um, Dr. Zutra's teaching. So things have stabilized somewhat. However, I need to point out that the future of Yiddish and Judaic studies at the university is far from secured. And if you care about all of this, please get in touch with me, get in touch with Professor Haskell Greenfield, the coordinator of, Judaic, of the Judaic studies program, um, and that we can build on you know, our efforts and um, um, you know, secure a future really for Jewish studies and university Jewish studies at the university here in, in Winnipeg. But enough of all of this. Let me um, most of all join me in welcoming Dr. Zutran tonight, who will speak about a cultural shift in Israeli society in a talk entitled, and I'm going to repeat the title here, The Return of the Jew, the Revival of Yiddish Culture in Post-Holocaust Israel. It's yours, Itai. Well, th thank you very much, Dr. Badel, uh, Ben, and thank you everyone for inviting me and participating. And uh, I hope it will be worth your time. I'll try to uh, stay on track and uh, uh, not go uh, over time uh, and keep the provocation to a minimum. Uh, so even though it's snowing outside, uh, I'll, I'm gonna start with talking about the place where the cedars grow uh, where it's now already the beginning of uh, Passover time of Pesach, uh, springtime in Israel. So let's go back to Israel and uh, hopefully we'll warm us up a little. Um, in 1929, at the peak of the language war between Zionist Hebraists and diaspora oriented Yiddishists, the Yiddish modernist poet in New York, Jacob Blatchstein, uh, wrote to his brothers in Palestine. And I quote, Dort wo die Zeder los men ken Yiddish nit reden, men los nit mein loschen kumen of en moil, die Mame Rochel, was hot dos ganze taitesch kumesch verweint, liegt of en mitweg a stumme, sie wollt geweint auf ihre Kinder, ober sie ken or jargon, ve oni, un ich, as ich wel amol kumen ken ziehen, vel ich herumgehen iberen land und schweigen wie a fisch, Kedei nitu zerzarenen, 
meine erweiterte Stiefbrüder, was haben sich gerade wird von Golles und seinen Eus gelesen geworden von verfluchten Jargon. There where the cedars grow, they don't allow people to speak Yiddish. Mother Rachel, who cried her heart out the entire Bible, is lying halfway speechless. She would have liked to cry for her children, but she only speaks Yiddish. And I, if I ever come to Zion, I will circle the entire land silent like a fish, as if not to upset my distant stepbrothers who rescued themselves from exile and were redeemed from the cursed Yiddish language. In this insightful poem, a parody of the now forgotten German Zionist anthem, Dort wo die Zeder, that was only second to Hatikva, the angry Gladstein summarizes the points of difference between the rivalry camps in two concurrent frames of reference, the linguistic and the familial, the, uh, the biblical Rachel that became after the destruction and in the words of the prophet Jeremiah, a symbol of Jewish maternal compassion, Rachel Mevakal Banea, Rachel weeping for her children, did so for Eastern European Jews, at least mostly in Yiddish. People read the Bible in Hebrew and later translated it orally into the vernacular. Therefore, for Gladstein and the majority of Yiddish speaking Jews, Zionists included, Rachel cries in Yiddish. And if she is supposed to follow the children of Israel back to their ancestral homeland, she will need to do so in Yiddish. But since zealot Zionists banned Yiddish, deeming it a verfluchten jargon, a corrupted form of German, Rachel stands on the threshold of the promised land between exile and redemption, speechless. She literally cannot speak. The speaker of the poem then says that if he, he will ever come to the land of the Zionists, he will do so silently, as if not to upset his der weiterte Stiefbrüder, distant stepbrothers, who redeemed themselves from Jewish diasporic faith and are now proudly speaking in the language of the Bible. Gladstein sarcastically deconstructs the imaginary national familial connection of Jews, not only that they are not biological brothers stemming from the same maternal descent, they also do not share the same language and ethical values. In this poem, it is the cosmopolitan New Yorker who is choosing to echo a more traditional uh, sentiment. Unlike the Zionists who adopted an imaginary and fake Israeli identity, he is still loyal to the traditions of Jews who were conceived and preserved in the Ashkenazi diaspora. Like a wise Jewish man, Aid, he explains to his Zionist brothers that since they are also a product of the Jewish diaspora, they will never be able to fully redeem themselves from their language, history, ethne and ethnic origin. Ethnicity and language are stronger forces than territory and archeology. span Blatchstein's poem written in 1929 is extremely useful in any attempt to study and explain the shifting relationship between Hebrew and Yiddish in the state of Israel after 1948. In the years following the writing of the poem, of this poem, the Jewish people went through extreme changes due primarily to the Holocaust, but also to cultural assimilation and the formation of the Jewish state. If in 1929, the majority of Jews in the world were of Ashkenazi descent living in the diaspora and Yiddish speakers to some extent, at the end of World War II, this situation changed dramatically, turning main, many of the political and linguistic uh, debates carefully outlined in the poem outdated. In the years following the establishment of Israel in May 1948, the young country who was just declared victorious in the war of independence, not only inherited vast amounts of land cleaned out of its native Palestinian population, it was also committed to the ideology of negation of the diaspora, uh, sorry, the ideology of ingathering uh, of diasporas, kibbutz galuyot, that went hand in hand with the previously mentioned negation of the diaspora, shlilat agola. Jews from around the world, but mostly from Arab countries and Holocaust survivors looked for refuge in the newly established homeland. The new Labour Zionist administration led by Prime Minister 
David Ben-Gurion, himself a Yiddish-speaking Jew from Plonsk, uh, wanted to gather the diasporas and turn them into a coherent nation in what was later uh, termed the melting pot. The melting pot ideology insisted that all Jews immigrates, immigrating to Israel will learn Hebrew, forget their past experiences in the diaspora, settle the land and defend it. They will build the land and rebuild themselves in the spirit of Zionist slogans. Ben-Gurion famously cited calling the new immigrants who in 1948, 1950, consisted of a majority of Holocaust survivors, avakadam, human dust. He was skeptical about the success of the government in transitioning these immigrants from weak diaspora victims to heroic native sabras, but also held it as an historical necessity. As a result of this anti-diasporic agenda, and in the early years of the state, the government actively favored Hebrew cultural production. Funds were given to Hebrew language publications, uh, theatrical productions in schools, while the same funds were denied of cultural production in other languages, such as Arabic, German, Romanian, and Yiddish, all declared foreign languages. The inclusion of Yiddish in the category of a foreign language infuriated Yiddish activists around the world who correctly viewed Yiddish and its speakers as victims of the Nazi extermination. How can Yiddish be called a foreign language together with German in the Jewish state? They cried. The inclusion nevertheless, this inclusion nevertheless allowed the Israeli government to issue special taxes on Yiddish theater, deny license to allow the publication of a Yiddish daily newspaper, and discriminate against Yiddish publishers in receiving paper that were then rationed by the government. Hebrew speak Hebrew, Ivri daber Ivrit, was the trend when in reality the majority of Israelis did not speak much Hebrew. Ideology aside, in reality the linguistic diversity of the new state and the need to address the immigrants in their own languages gradually relaxed these draconian obstacles on Yiddish production in the Jewish state. One needs to keep in mind a few major factors. The majority of Israeli political and cultural elites were themselves of Ashkenazi descent and spoke Yiddish to some extent. Not everyone in Ben-Gurion's government supported such an extreme anti-diasporic agenda and mostly, the majority of American Jews who the government wished to harness to the support of Zionism also spoke Yiddish. In the years after the Holocaust, many uh, diaspora Jews in the free world, uh, excluding Soviet Jews behind the Iron Curtain, in Europe and the Americas and as far as Australia, came from Yiddish speaking homes. Yiddish newspapers, theaters and schools were in full swing, yet not as prosperous as before. In this, if the state wanted them to immigrate to Israel, or at least, and most more realistically, to financially and politically support it, it needed to change its approach to Yiddish and its diasporic culture. So from a realistic necessity, but yet also from a personal connection to Yiddish, the leaders of Israel gradually lifted the restrictions on Yiddish production used Yiddish as a propaganda vehicle in both Israel and the diaspora and eventually accepted it as part of the Jewish state cultural inheritance with both its negative and positive aspects. Agents of change came from outside of Israel, from the diaspora and also and in growing numbers from inside, from the community of Holocaust survivors, Sheri Sapleite. In order to gain support uh, among Yiddish-speaking progressive Jews, the Israeli labor Zionist government invested in Yiddish publications in the diaspora and in sponsoring visits of Yiddish intellectuals who would later either immigrate to Israel or write favorably about its progress. One such notable example is the previously uh, discussed uh, Jacob Gladstein, who after the Holocaust worked for the labor Zionist weekly, the Yiddisher Kempfer the Jewish fighter, published in New York there, among statistics about milk production in the kibbutzim and articles on socialism by Ben-Gurion, one can find some of Gladstein's most critical poems about Israeli military aggression, 
But at this time, from the perspective of a reserved supporter trying to influence the young state's moral character. In November of 1962, the Israeli dailies report about Gladstein's visits accompanied uh, with his wife, with Ben-Gurion in Tel Aviv and with the mayor of Jerusalem. Parties, receptions, meetings with Yiddish and Hebrew writers and tours of the country followed. Uh, trips of Yiddish writers from America in the 1950s and 1960s were a common occurrence in the Jewish state. Some, such as Itzik Mangel, Sholemash, and Dovid Pinsky stayed, while others like Gladstein, Isaac Bashevi Singer, and Hey Levik, uh, to name but a few, had wine, visited the holy sites, they had to look at the Western world from the other side of the Jordanian border, climbed Masada, went to Yad Vashem, ate at the kibbutz dining room, and returned to America with open hearts. Even the Jewish socialist Bund and its North American version, the Rabbeter Ring, the Workman's Circle, a fierce advocate of diaspora nationalism and an opposition to Zionism, supported the socialist Jewish state and its kibbutz movement and labor unions, arguing that the Israeli government is in charge of socialism, while the Bund would be in charge of Yiddish and Holocaust commemoration. Itzik Mangel, the provocative poet who survived the war in England and America, came to live in Israel in 1966, several years before his death in 1969. In a poem written before his first trip to Israel in 1958, he wrote, Ich hob sich Joren gewalgert in der Fremd, itzt vor ich sich walgeren in der Heim. For years I wallowed about in the world, now I am going home to wallow there. Manger knew well that Yiddish is a diasporic language and that Yiddish speaking old people go to Israel only to die and be closer to the Messiah. Manger's final move to Israel, however, only became possible after the success of his musical comedy, Di Megile, The Book of Esther, performed in the original Yiddish by the Burstein family from New York in front of packed audiences in Jaffa in 1965. The success of a Yiddish musical on the Hebrew stage that was popular among Yiddish speakers and their children alike, marked a few years after the Eichmann trial in 1961, the revival of Yiddish in the Jewish state. The Polish-born Yiddish comedians, Jigan and Schumacher, were also successful making fun in Yiddish of the Israeli shtetl realities, studying, uh, standing in opposition to the state's official socialist ideology. As the slow, yet steady success of Yiddish popular theater and humor in Israel had to do with nostalgia to the world that was perished in the Holocaust, but also with the work of individuals, Holocaust survivors, who campaigned for a better relationship between the state and Yiddish. Mordechai Tzanin was until his death in 2009, the main address for Yiddish in Israel. A survivor from Poland and a gifted journalist, Tzanin was the editor and publisher of Let's Tenayes, Last News, the most popular Yiddish daily in Israel and among the country's most popular papers. Founded in November 1949, the paper became a daily 10 years later after Tzanin's successful legal campaign to allow free press in the country. Ironically, it was Ben-Gurion's party Mapai who purchased the paper in 1960. Let's deny us published news about what is happening in the country in the language that the new immigrants understood. It also gave them information about how to learn Hebrew, receive medical treatment, reparations from Germany, information about surviving relatives, Holocaust commemorations, and Yiddish literary entertainment. Sanin's newspaper was a popular paper trying to get Holocaust survivors closer to the country and the country closer to them. In charge of Yiddish high culture in the state of Israel was the poet Avrom Sutzkever. Sutzkever, who was born in Vilna and survived the war in the ghetto and later fighting with the partisans, escaped Soviet Russia to Paris. There, he was met with Zionist leader and later Prime Minister, Minister Golda Meir, uh, who promised him the Histadrut, Israeli labor union support in the publication of a Yiddish literary journal. Sutzkever, with his wife and kids, settled in Tel Aviv and in the summer of 1949, published the first volume of the Golden Kate, The Golden Change, arguably the best Yiddish publication in the world. 
that was published consistently from 1949 until 1995. Named after the famous Yiddish play by Yudla Peretz and symbolizing the cultural con continuation of the Yiddish uh, civilization, the Golden Akate published Yiddish poets, writers, and intellectuals from around the world, minus the Soviet Union. Regardless to political affiliation, uh, the journal managed to remain neutral and dedicated primarily to Yiddish literature and culture. For instance, even though writers from the Soviet Union couldn't attend, it was Sutzkever together with Yiddish professor Hone Shmeruk, who in 1964 published a Spiegel Oifashtein, the most comprehensive anthology of Soviet Yiddish literature to this day. Isaac Bashevi Singer, Jacob Gladstein, Kadia Moladovsky, Chava Rosenfarb, and Bluma Lempel were among the most prestigious out of country participants in the Golden Ekate. In addition to the ingathering of Yiddish writers, countering or more correctly, literally implementing of the Zionist notion of the uh, ingathering of the diasporas, the journal was also the home of Yiddish writers who immigrated to Israel before or after 1948. In October 1951, a group called Young Israel, Young Israel, gathered in Kibbutz Yagur and declared, under the supervision of Sutzkever, the establishment of a new Israeli Yiddish literature that will be both Israeli and Yiddish in content and in form. The most notable members of Jung Israel were Yossel Birstein, who immigrated to Israel from Australia, where he spent uh, the war years away from his native Poland, Svi Eisenman, a Bundist from Warsaw, who survived the war in Russia and lived on a kibbutz, uh, Avrom Karpinovich from Vilna, and Rivke Basman, uh, also a Holocaust survivor from Lithuania. Educated in Yiddish before the war and after experiencing the horrors of the Holocaust in Nazi-occupied Europe, or in the Soviet Union, these writers were ready to embrace the new life Israel promised them, but also refused to forget the past. Unlike Israeli-born Hebrew writers of the time who wrote about the war, the establishment of kibbutzim, empty Palestinian towns, and the new immigrants changing the landscape, the Yiddish newcomers comers wrote firsthand about the Holocaust, the families who stayed behind, the immigrants uh, the, the nightmares of the new immigrants who can now not be overcome the past, the hostility of the sabras towards the survivors, and since they lived mostly in the Israeli periphery about Arabs and Sephardi immigrants, Yiddish writers as insiders and outsiders were better prepared to reflect realistically and authentically on the shortcomings of the Jewish state. Yiddish writers in Israel were the first ones to write openly about the Holocaust, the mass immigration to Israel, the Palestinian problem, marginalized communities such as Haredi Jews, Holocaust survivors, and Sephardi Jews, post-traumatic stress syndrome among army veterans, and the social injustices of the young idealistic state. Yet the publications of Jung Israel and the Labour Party-sponsored Golden Ekate did not exceed beyond the shrinking uh, circles of committed Yiddish speaking intellectuals around the world. The Golden Akate, for instance, did not reach circulation of more than 1,500 copies, and it was published four times a year. In the later years, its later years, for more or less the 1970s, 1980s, and 90s, it became less dedicated to new Yiddish literature, but rather to republishing and studying its pre-Holocaust period. It became more academic and less vibrant. The success of popular Yiddish theater and newspapers in Israel also did not last very long. And the new generation of, um, as the new generation of Israeli born Sabras lost their linguistic capabilities in Yiddish, as well as their interest in the world of Yiddish that seemed old fashioned and cheeky. Also with the rise of ultra Orthodox Yiddish speaking Haredi Jews, Yiddish, who always symbolized for Israeli, secular Israelis, Jewish victimhood in the diaspora, became associated with anti-Zionist, anti-secular, and non-progressive sentiment. In his short story, In the Neighborhood Where Biblical Prophets, originally published in the Golden Ekate in 1989, uh, with the title Erev Pesach in Mea She'orim, Passover in Mea She'arim, Yossel Birstein illustrates the possibilities of mediating the Yiddish world of ultra-Orthodox Jews to secular Israelis in a polarized society. 
a nameless Yiddish-speaking secular Israeli, Birstein himself, is going on the eve of Passover to look for King Solomon Street in Jerusalem. In the days before GPS, the narrator assumes he could conveniently find the street with all the other streets in the city named after biblical prophets. In reality, King Solomon Street, who was actually not a prophet, is in the other direction. As it happens, the streets named after biblical prophets are located in the heart of the Haredi neighborhood of Mea Sharim in downtown Jerusalem. The narrator spots an old Haredi woman carrying a heavy samovar to kosher it for Passover. He offers in Yiddish to help her carry it in exchange for directions. The woman agrees, happy to speak Yiddish with a secular Zionist, but is confused about what the man is looking for in King Solomon Street, knowing well he is not a prophet. Is there oich zvishin din neviyim? Is he also among the prophets? She asks. As a pious religious woman in need, she tells him better to give up his unclear business and help her with a mitzvah, a good deed. The real reason for the man's visit to the Haredi neighborhood is revealed when they uh, reach a cheder, a school, where young children are reciting Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, in Hebrew and Yiddish, in preparation for the holiday. The scroll attributed to King Solomon is traditionally recited on the Sabbath of Passover. Ichob ufgechab koiles fun cheder, fun a cheder, yingelach, hoben gelernt shira shirem, mitten alten nigen, mitten selben nigen, hob ich in meine kinder joren, gelernt in cheder, shira shirem. From the sound of the voices emanating from the open window of a cheder, I guess that the boys were reviewing the song of songs in that old chant I still remembered from my own days as a cheder student. The mysterious man is homesick, and the only place where he can find his childhood in a small Polish shtetl is in the Yiddish-speaking, ultra-Orthodox, Hasidic streets of the Holy City with streets named after biblical prophets, uh, biblical dignities. His childhood was cut short because of the war, while his family and the rest of the shtetl Jews were perished. As after the man gets his portion of memory that he needs to nourish uh, his aching soul, he forgets about King Solomon Street, the realistic time and place of modern Israel with its banks, stock exchange, Birstein tells the woman he used to be an investment banker, and cultural wars between secular and Haredi Jews don't seem to matter anymore and are clearing way for a more elevated spiritual reality, the one of memory. In his search of his lost Yiddish childhood, Yossel Birstein realized that he would have to look for it among ultra-Orthodox Haredi Jews, still living the life of pre-modern Eastern European Jews and not among modern Hebrew-speaking Israelis. Ironically, it is Haredi Jews who live biblically among biblical prophets and not the Israeli Zionists, whose main intention was to move back to the land of the Bible in both time and space. The real, Zionism, so the real Zionism for Birstein is hence the ingathering and protecting of living Jews and the preservation of their ancient diasporic ways of life and not the Zionist official policy of the negation of the diaspora. Published in the pages of the Golden Ekate, this short story did not make such a great impression. Hebrew translations of Yiddish writers past and present also did not receive much of a commercial success in opposition to their critical acclaim. In Israel, as well as other places, with the exception of a few such as Sholem Aleichem or Isaac Bashevi Singer. What, Yiddish what literature- I'm on, Zoom, I'm on Zoom, go ahead. Can, can, please, can you please mute yourself? Uh, Yiddish literature was almost virtually unknown to Hebrew readers, and, it and if it was read, it was mostly in relation to Holocaust commemoration. To this day, Israeli high schoolers sing and recite as Brent, Zognit Kainmol, and Unter Deine Weisse Stern on Yom HaShoah. Birstein, as well as other Yiddish uh, intellectuals in Israel, understood by the 1970s and 1980s that Yiddish and Hebrew changed roles. Yiddish that used to be the dominant Jewish vernacular, while Hebrew, the spiritual, uh, essentially non-spoken holy language, 
has now become a type of holy spiritual language of memory and identity, while Hebrew became the dominant Jewish vernacular. Israeli Jews speak Hebrew, heavily influenced by Yiddish, while Yiddish could and should be remembered and commemorated as the language of the Jewish martyrs perished in the Holocaust, but also as a reminder of what it means to be Yiddish or Jewish. The ideology of the negation of the diaspora did not only negate Yiddish and its speakers, but also, and more importantly, negated its form of Jewishness, Yiddishkeit, that involved good deeds, family values, communal solidarity, and compassion for the marginalized and oppressed. The cultural heritage of Yiddish, both religious and secular, would remind Israelis that there are also Jews and that thousands of years of Jewish life in the diaspora cannot and should not be erased. In order to preserve and immortalize Yiddish for future generations, Birstein translated and later, he died in 2003, even wrote his Yiddish stories in Hebrew in a reversal of the past tradition to translate and mediate the Hebrew Bible into the Yiddish vernacular, Taich. For young Israeli readers, myself included, he together, he together with Sutzkever and Yiddish literature all together was a breath of fresh air, a type of ancient Jewish storyteller, storytelling and healing, who with humor, sensitivity and wisdom can cure all illnesses of living in a country infected by violence, trauma and harshness. Uh, in her poem In Stilkeit, In Silence, written in the new millennium, Poet Rivka Basman Ben Chaim, who already celebrated her 97th birthday, writes that in Stilkeit Reidich Yiddish, Mimamakim, by Tog is Gringed Reden Ivrit, Bioren was Fareden und Antleufen, Baroiben von Beide Le Schoines Ditrit. In silence I speak Yiddish, the profundis. By day it's easier to speak Hebrew. The years which distract and escape snatch my stride from the two. During the day, it is easier for the survivor Yiddish poet to speak modern Israeli Hebrew as both a form of necessary communication, as well as a way to put on an act of sanity in a protection from nightmares. At night, Yiddish comes out of the abyss, exposing the poet's deepest fears emotions and traumas. Even though both day and night languages consisting the poet's full self uh, would at the end of the poem not uh, prevent her in her inevitable death, the poem is written in Yiddish for eternity, for everyone and to no one, since only in Yiddish the nightmarish language of the Jewish psyche, she can truly be herself. Ironically, but intentionally, the word used in the poem for death, mimamakim, stems from the arsenal of Jewish devotion to God. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord, Psalm 130. Yiddish is the new Loshen Koidesh, holy tongue, or even the Loshen Hakodoshim, the language of the martyrs who perished in the Holocaust and who mostly spoke Mame Loshen, mother's tongue, Yiddish. The gradual collapse of the Israeli secular liberal and labor Zionist Ashkenazi elites felt most profoundly after the Yom Kippur War, called today the old elites, came together with the demis of Yiddish as a spoken language by secular Israelis who became more and more indifferent to Yiddish. If, it, if in the first few decades of the state's existence, Zionists rejected the Yiddish that, they, that, rejected the Yiddish that they had spoken, by the 1970s, there was already almost nothing to reject. The rising new elites, consisting of right-wing Jews led by Menachem Begin, a Polish Jew, Mizrahi Jews, Haredi Jews, Palestinians, Jews from the former Soviet Union and such, challenged the socialist, Zionist, modernist, and secular utopia of the founding fathers, especially the agenda of the negation of the diaspora. Israeli Jews started searching for their roots and looked for Jewish alternatives in both religious observance and Yiddish secularism. 
the return of the diaspora Jew in contemporary Israel opens up new possibilities for a renewed engagement with Yiddish as a universal, pluralistic, and transnational Yiddish cultural identity. Second generation passive Yiddish speakers visit the Yiddish theater, Yiddish Spiel, where veterans of the Hebrew stage perform in their native tongue, lost, forgot, long forgotten. Young Israelis, myself included, study Yiddish in universities and summer programs. Excellent translations of Yiddish literature are published by the best publishing houses and Hebrew language studies of all aspects of Ashkenazi history and culture are written by the best scholars. In 1996, the Israeli Knesset finally passed a Yiddish bill allocating necessary funds for the preservation of Yiddish, uh, making it the second country in the world to do so. The first country was the Soviet Union. In addition to Yiddish cultural activity in the original, but mostly in translation, that still appears appeals to a very few, Israeli popular culture is also opening up and warming up to Yiddish from a language of obscene jokes, unheroic behavior, passivity, and sickness. Yiddish on Israeli TV seems to be more and more like the cool thing to be. The Israeli popular drama series Shtisel, available on Netflix, follows the life of contemporary anti-Zionist ultra-Orthodox Haredi Jews living in downtown Jerusalem. The Im immediate and extended Shtisel family and their friends and community members all speak Yiddish young and old, men and women, at home and on the street, in school, synagogue, hospital, and ho hotel lobbies, where the young Akiva takes his dates. Secular Israelis are a rarity on the show and are usually servicing the Haredi community or show a potential threat. The streets of Jerusalem never seem so packed with ultra-Orthodox Jews of all sects who usually serve in Israeli films together with Arabs as the marginalized other and a threat to the secular and national hegemony. Yet one does not notice, it does notice an interesting shift in Yiddish fluency and function in the Haredi community that is actually not much different from the role of Yiddish in the secular world. Uh, the younger Israeli born Shtisel speak modern Israeli Hebrew as their main language. Kives Bobe Malke, representing the older generation of European Haredim speak Lithuanian Yiddish as her main language, marking her as right-wing anti-Zionist yet not Hasidic Haredi woman. Kiva's father Shulem and uncle Nuchem, who visit from Antwerp, speak Yiddish with the Bobe and among themselves, but with the younger generation in modern Israeli Hebrew, using the Sephardi pronunciation. Hebrew words like Shabbos, Teire, Reshuim, Arurim, and so forth are pronounced even when Hebrew is spoken in traditional Ashkenazi Hebrew. Modern Israeli Hebrew is also used in the Sephardi pronunciation when Yiddish is used, clearly marking it as a different form, as different from Ashkenazi Hebrew or Loshen Koidesh. Kiva's own generation can understand Yiddish and speak it to some extent but is removed from it as modern Israeli Hebrew is now their main linguistic tool. Haredim choose to make the effort and speak Yiddish as part of their religious insularity and cultural resistance to Zionist hegemony, to Zionist hegemony. But in reality, it is Hebrew that serve as their true vernacular, the language of daily usage. For non-ultra-Orthodox Israelis today, Yiddish is a marker of memory, sanctity, and cultural identity rather than a living, changing vernacular. In the new Israeli mosaic, Ashkenazi descent Israelis search for alternatives to the official ideologies of modern Israel, such as the negation of the diaspora, rootless secularism, national heroism, and the melting pot. They are replaced with the more hybridic, pluralistic, and inclusive notions of familial and ancestry, cultural and non-religious connection uh, to Jewish civilization in the diaspora, meaningful Holocaust commemoration, and a positive attitude to Ashkenazi folkways, gefilte fish together with falafel, klezmer with Israeli rock, and Hebrew with Yiddish, 
and not Hebrew against Yiddish. In the final stanzas of, uh, stanza of his previously mentioned poem, Ich ob sich Joren gewalgert, Itzik Manker wrote about his first encounter with the land of Israel. Ich will stein vertracht vor dein Midberg Groys und herren die deures alte Kemel tritt, was wiegen auf seere Heukers iberen Samt, teure und schreure und das alte Wanderlied, was zittert über die Samten heiße Glied, starbt ob der Mond sich und will kein Mal nicht vergehen. Ich will nicht kuschen dein Samt, nein mal nein, was heißt kuschen dein Samt? Ich bin dein Samt. Und wer kuscht es? Ich bete euch, sich allein. Musing, I'll stand before your great desert and hear the camels' ancient tread as they sway with trade and Torah on their humps. I'll hear the age-old hovering wonder song that trembles over glowing sand and dyes and then recalls itself and not disappear. I'll not kiss your sand, no, and 10 times no. How can I kiss your sand? I am your sand. And how, I ask you, can I kiss myself? Mangel's nomadic refusal to kiss the sand of the Holy Land in a defiance of tradition is Yiddish literature's major contribution to the state of Israel. You should not sanctify the land, but critically sanctify its people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Itai. This has been a fascinating and incredibly rich talk. So I am just expect a... Let me catch my breath. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We all need a pause. <laughs> Is there... So um, how I'd like to do this, if people like to ask a question or make a comment, um, preferably, you know, raise your hand. So in the, in the reactions, um, you know, um, um, yes, yes. Oh, okay. So Dan, Dan Stone, you have the first question here. Go ahead. Dan, oh, okay. Should you like me to read it? Okay. I, I, yeah. So here, Dan Stone wrote, thank you for the fascinating yeah. talk. Did enough Yiddish survive in the USSR? For the immigration to influence Yiddish and Israel. Yeah, for sure. I, I had to erase this from my uh, my talk. I couldn't talk about everything, but uh, definitely in the 1970s, uh, there was a wave of uh, Yiddish uh, refuseniks, right? So uh, people who uh, uh, were um, um, people who who were uh, sorry. I have to gather my thoughts after this talk, but uh, people who who, who were uh, fighting the Soviet Union and they were allowed immigration to Israel. And many of them were uh, veterans of Yiddish literature, some of them from before the Holocaust, but mostly from, most of them from after the Holocaust, for the, when the Soviet Union uh, we allowed uh, after the uh, Khrushchev, uh, uh, after the death of Stalin and the Khrushchev uh, discoveries, there was a revival of Yiddish in the Soviet Union in the 1950s and 60s. And by the 1970s in Israel and 80s, again, uh, the Israeli government wanted to get these Yiddish speaking intellectuals come from the Soviet Union to Israel and ally themselves with uh, Israel against the Soviet Union and against the uh, anti-Jewish policies of the Soviet Union. So it was part of the Israeli campaign and American campaign as well against uh, for the for the uh, 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 let my people go campaign, right? The Yadut uh, Mama, the the silent uh, silent uh, the silent Jews. So yes, Yiddish writers uh, uh, did come to Israel. Rochel Boimvol uh, uh, and. Um, and uh, Do, uh, Yosef, Yosef Kerler, and uh, uh, actually a very interesting woman, Yente Mash. Uh, uh, but maybe I can talk about, about this later. I don't want to keep, uh, I want people to have time to ask questions because I can talk all night about this. But this is, a, it, it, so the answer is yes. And I just ask, <coughs> ask you to add another sentence or two about the immigration, the most recent wave of immigration starting in the 1980s, late 1980s and 90s. 
uh, also you you asking about a, the later period yes yes uh, for sure you know it's interesting that some of the uh, scholars today the younger generation uh, what, what's young right 50 people in their 50s uh, uh, who are scholars of Yiddish today in Israeli universities do come from uh, the Soviet Union. Um, this is the same uh, also for uh, North America. Uh, uh, and, uh, and they were it got interested uh, in Yiddish in the later stages of the Soviet Union for, for the same reasons that I pointed out in my talk about Israeli born uh, the uh, Ashkenazi Israelis like myself got interested in Yiddish uh, in spite of, so I, for me, it was in spite of the Zionist ideology of negation of diaspora, but in the Soviet Union, it was part of the repression of Jewish culture in general. So some people, of course, became interested in Hebrew and Zionism, like Sheransky, but then there were people who uh, were interested in secular uh, Yiddish culture. And some of them did arrive uh, in Israel and definitely influenced the, uh, uh, the continuation and the revival of Yiddish uh, culture in, uh, in Israel. I, I can mention someone like uh, Ber Kotlerman, who is a professor uh, at Barilan University, and he's actually from Birubijan, uh, right from if anyone knows Birubijan, and he immigrated to Israel, I believe, in the 1990s. Uh, and he writes about a Soviet uh, Yiddish culture from a, the perspective of the post-Soviet uh, era. So some of these people immigrated into is, in, 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 to Israel, uh, I, I believe, and some of them also immigrated uh, to North America and are now active in uh, North American universities. But yes, for sure. They, and you can also see that in the Yiddish theater, right? If you go to Yiddish theater in Israel, but also in New York, you will uh, meet a lot of uh, Russian speaking, uh, either people, Russians either who are fluent in Yiddish or second or third generation of Russian speakers who uh, know some Yiddish. And, and that's why in the Yiddish theater, both in Israel and America, in New York, uh, they have subtitles in Russian and in English and in Hebrew, of course. Yeah, so you always hear Russian. Uh, in, uh, in uh, Israeli Yiddish uh, circles. Bere, you wanted to. Thank you, actually. My question follows up on, on what you just said. Um, I had the opportunity many times to attend Yiddish Spiel in, in Israel. Right. And I noticed that the veteran actors were, you know, um, mostly Romanian backgrounds, like the older actors. Right. But the younger actors were all uh, of Russian background. And so my question is, I mean, their Yiddish was, was perfect. And did they uh, come? These were people, you know, in their 20s and 30s that were performing. No, did no. they come to Israel with Yiddish or did they just, did they learn it in Israel? Or did they yeah, yeah, just they, like they actors it. sort of learn it for the play itself? Yeah, uh, I, I, I doubt that, but you know, I, I, I will stand corrected if, if I'm wrong, but my impression is, is uh, uh, that they did not come speaking Yiddish from home. Uh, they studied Yiddish either in universities like I did, I, I did not speak Yiddish at home, uh, or as you said, like actors uh, studying uh, roles, but they are doing a, a, a tremendous uh, job. Uh, they're very talented actors and uh, uh, playing in this tradition of uh, the Russian theater, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, they're, they're a big asset uh, to uh, to the Yiddish uh, theater in Israel. But they are now um, at the, the more established uh, Yiddish field. Uh, they usually uh, tends to be a little more on the popular side, uh, musicals, and uh, usually, you know, it, it's really hard. One needs to remember that. Uh, even if uh, there are, there is an interest in uh, in Yiddish, right? And people are learning uh, Yiddish, uh, native Israelis or native Russians. But uh, the majority of people who come to these uh, events uh, like to hear Yiddish, but not necessarily fully understand it. So the uh, you can't really play like uh, a Shakespeare in, in Yiddish or something like that, or some of the great Yiddish plays. You really have to go between the, the thin line between 
a good quality production that would be also um, understood and attract uh, people with some affiliation uh, to Yiddish. Uh, and then, of course, there are subtitles. Um, but yeah, it, it is a very good, uh, good quality theater. And now, in addition to Yiddish field, there are also uh, uh, younger people like Yoni Eilat. Yoni Eilat is an Israeli actor and singer, and he performs uh, all over the country uh, with uh, very interesting uh, Yiddish plays. Uh, and he's not part of the Yiddish spiel, uh, right? So, and he does a really good job with a group of uh, ensemble of uh, Israeli born uh, actors who, who are very, very committed uh, to Yiddish and they have good teachers. Uh, one needs to remem uh, also remind, uh, I didn't mention it in my talk, but one of my uh, teachers of Yiddish, Avrom Noverstern from the Hebrew University, he was born in Argentina, but he immigrated to Israel. Uh, he's doing a great, great job, Le uh, COVID Yiddish, in honor of Yiddish in Israel. He took uh, over uh, the Sholem Aleichem uh, Institute in Tel Aviv and turned it into a very, very bright, vibrant uh, home for Yiddish. They have Yiddish classes uh, for adults and, and young people. They have Yiddish uh, plays, uh, Yiddish talks. Uh, it's right in the center of the city of Tel Aviv, uh, right by the uh, Israeli uh, opera and the Israeli uh, the Tel Aviv court. If you're ever in Tel Aviv, uh, you should check out Beit Shalom Alechem. Thank you. Daya, would you like to ask a question yourself? Or? Uh, I could. Hi, Itai, and thank you. Uh, so my question is, uh, I mean, while you're painting quite a, 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 a vibrant picture of, of, of Yiddish thriving or pockets of Yiddish thriving in Israel, it still seems to be uh, at always at, at, at some tension and divisions associated with it in present day Israel. Say the, uh, the Haredi versus the secular, Ashkenazi uh, versus Sephardi. Right. Uh, so it's not, I mean, what's your take on it? Huh? I, 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 I admit that uh, the last uh, part of my talk was wishful thinking. <laughs> Let's hope when the Messiah will come. You know, the famous joke by Isaac Bashevi Singer. They asked him, uh, why are you writing in a dying language? And he said, because I'm a believer. And when the Messiah will come and all the Jews uh, uh, will come back to life, uh, the first question that you ask, is there something new to read in Yiddish? Uh, so yes, uh, Dalia, you're right. Uh, it's a, it, but I've been to many Yiddish events. I mean, I've been living here in North America for the last 20 years, but uh, every time I go to Israel, I, I, I bring back, uh, you're right, that are, it's not uh, mass produced. It's not, it's not like, you know, uh, there aren't, uh, you know, uh, uh, people lining up uh, to watch uh, a Yiddish spiel, right? <laughs> and waiting in tents overnight uh, to watch, uh, to get tickets to the Yiddish theater. But it's way, way bigger than when I, uh, when I started studying Yiddish at the beginning of the millennium. Uh, I think uh, it, there's a tremendous uh, interest. Uh, Yiddish uh, literature, uh, is now translated really by the best translators. And every few months I have to order a new book that came out in Israel. Either, uh, by the way, I need to mention that speaking of, of uh, the revival of Yiddish uh, uh, in Israel, whether it's my wishful thinking or uh, as Dalia pointed out, something more realistic, uh, uh, the, this, uh, this uh, talk wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for a uh, scholarship. I mean, I didn't do all the work myself, right? Uh, giving you, so uh, I, I need to reveal my sources, right? So I was uh, uh, relying heavily on a book that came out in English uh, a couple of years ago by an Israeli scholar called Yiddish in Israel, a history, Rachel Rozhansky. 
uh, who is a professor uh, at Brown University, and it's called Yiddish in Israel, a history. Uh, and I did uh, also consult uh, uh, sources that came out uh, in Hebrew in the last few years uh, by uh, Gali Drucker, uh, Baram, and Avram Noverstern, and I, I can, Ben Imer, I can mention a lot of names and I can give a lot of sources. Um, yeah, the future of Yiddish in Israel, I, I think I tried to, to mention it, to, 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 to make this more explicit in my talk, that we're talking about small numbers. Uh, we are talking about uh, the people who are interested in culture, right? Uh, but, but even when we talk about that one, I, that's why I, I, I pointed out to Stiesel, suddenly Netflix is full of Yiddish. I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, both uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. We have Israeli shows like Stiesel, uh, and we have uh, the uh, unorthodox, right? Uh, about the Satmar Hasidim uh, in Brooklyn, uh, which, and then, and, and uh, in order to make uh, shows, realistic, realistic shows about a uh, life of uh, ultra orthodox uh, communities uh, the producers of this uh, of these shows uh, do it in yiddish and i think the yiddish in stiesel is pretty good uh, by the way uh, uh, bell uh, one of the romanian born actresses uh, that you may you may have watched uh, in the theater is uh, uh, is the one who plays the bob uh, bob malke uh, and she, uh, what uh, the, the second one, because they had the first one that but then I think the actress died and they replaced her with uh, uh, she's a very famous Israeli uh, Hebrew actor who was born in Chernovitz. But uh, she, uh, what's her name? Why can I, why am I blanking on her name? Leah, 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 Leah Kenny. And uh, but she, uh, she is pretending to speak the Lithuanian accent, of, a dialect of Yiddish. But uh, I think even the younger generation is doing a good job. Uh, so Dalia, don't be so don't be so cynical. <laughs> no, no, it's not about cynicism. I just wonder if Iraqi uh, Jews and uh, Syrian Jews and Moroccan Jews, if their languages will also be revived. But there, there is also the Arab component. That's right. Yeah, I wanted to keep the provocation to a to a limit. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. But I agree with you. But how, Adalia, how, how much? Uh, I mean, I I talk. I focused on Yiddish. I I can't uh, be. Yes, of course, it's a it's a it's part of a bigger phenomenon. Uh, of uh, I think because Sephardi Jews, Mizrahi Jews. Uh, after 77, right? Uh, the rise of uh, the Likud uh, to power, uh, they got more and more interested within their own uh, diasporic cultures. And because of that, also Ashkenazi descent Jews started to say, where are we from? So maybe they're not so much into gefilte fish. I, I was, I thought it was cute, gefilte fish with falafel. Falafel is way more popular than gefilte fish, but Let's give the filter fish uh, some respect, especially before Pesach. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other comment or question? Maybe one more. If there's no one, I think I like to ask one. So Ita, you gave us this big trajectory from Ben Goyon as Yiddish as a foreign language to the this very lively subculture. Right. What what were the most important breaks? What were the when I mean it was this, it was sort of you presented it as this one continuous story. Are right. there actually are there actually if there was one significant shift, um, where would you identify this? Or is yeah, this maybe a, I buried this uh, some of yeah yeah I I well definitely nineteen forty eight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Right. <laughs> I would say the Eichmann trial of 1961, big, big, uh, uh, 1973, the Yom Kippur War, anything between 67, six day war, the big heroism, and then the uh, big failure of 73. 
77, which I just mentioned, right? The uh, rise of Likud uh, to power and the decline of the labor Zionist uh, hegemony. Um, I did mention the uh, uh, Russian immigrants uh, of uh, the 70s and the, uh, the, 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 also the, the, the move, the immigration to Israel of uh, Soviet Yiddish writers uh, in two waves, in the 70s and later in the 90s. And uh, you, there's plenty of other uh, important dates that they, they're all buried. Uh, you know, you're a historian, Ben. I'm a literary scholar, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, and definitely uh, the uh, chronology is from this book, from uh, Rachel Rojansky. Right. So your understanding is of a, of a sort of a steady trajectory with, with multiple steps along the way. So, so thank you so much. This was fascinating. There's way more, way more to know and way more to learn. And um, you know, and it's it's beautiful to hear about the this revival and livelihood um, of Yiddish also in Israel today. If you wanted to get more involved with Yiddish and learn Yiddish with Itai, there's going to be he's going to teach a first year Yiddish language class in the fall at the University of Manitoba. That is going to be um, hybrid, meaning you can come in person and you can, you know, join on Zoom. And he's also going to teach a middle level class in Hebrew if you, know, you can, if you can sort of sub, sub, supplement your, your Yiddish with Hebrew um, as, you know, as a priority should be. And in the fall, a Yiddish culture class um, in North America um, and then more classes in the winter. So, um, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Itai. Yeah, and, and, I, and thank, thank you for inviting me and officiating this. And Afrelich and Pesach, Chag Sameach. Thank you. And I think um, Dan Stone is going to have the another concluding word, or is this no? no it's, it's it's me. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so first of all, a shame dunk. That was that was just a delightful. And um, you know, I I just also think back to when I lived in Paris and um, my father was so excited because there were actually five Yiddish dailies based on um, political lines. So he wasn't so interested. There's actually a book that just came out that I haven't read about Yiddish in Paris. So look it up. Ah, ah. Yeah. Um, he wasn't so hot on the on the communist one, but but still excited that it existed. So I just want to mention some of our exciting upcoming programs. On April the 7th, from 10 a.m. to 11.45, we are holding for the first time a virtual Holocaust and Human Rights Symposium. This is the 20th year of the symposium, but because of COVID, we're doing it virtually and therefore, for the first time, we can welcome the general public instead of just high school students. Our guest speakers will be Stefan Carter, a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, and Negan Sinclair, well-known Anishinaabe scholar and journalist. And our moderator will be Carly Saposnik Evans. On May the 16th, we will partner with the Gray Academy again for the annual exhibit of drawings by Gray Academy students. This year's theme is Buildings by the architectural firm of GBR, Green, Russell, and Blankstein. On June the 8th, the Saul and Florence Caney Distinguished Lecture with CNN anchor and Chief Washington Correspondent Jake Tapper at Congregation Sherazetic Synagogue. Mr. Tapper's uh, um, speech will be about the fate of democracy and tickets are available on eventbrite.ca or by contacting me at jewishheritage at jhcwc.org. You can also find uh, ticketing links on our website, jhcwc.org. Our Holocaust Education Center Museum is being totally renovated. So please watch for news of our reopening in the coming months. And finally, if you haven't already done so, register for our newsletter to receive updates on programming and to read fascinating historical vignettes from our community's history. 
Thank you very much. And thank you for coming. Thank you to Itai. Thank you to Ben, to Dan, and to all of our attendees. Thank you, Ben. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.